pretty much in a barn. And you know what? It's still all good. I'm Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn and Alice Bryant. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Many poor parents in African countries say their children will have to miss the beginning of school this year. Classes are returning after months of delay because of COVID-19, the disease caused by the new coronavirus. Mike Sakago is headmaster of Wampiwo in Take Secondary School near Uganda's capital, Kampala. He has answered concerns from parents struggling to have their children in schools for the first time since March. Many are worried over financial struggles caused by the coronavirus health crisis. They also are concerned about how to protect students in often crowded classrooms. Chicago told the Associated Press, that only half of his 430 students had reported to class the day after he began admitting students for the new school term. School officials worry some children might not return because their parents have not been working, he said. In Uganda, officials have set requirements that schools must meet before they can admit students. Most of them could remain at home until as late as next year. Schools must have enough hand-washing areas and enough space in classrooms and living areas for social distancing. While the health crisis has affected education around the world, the crisis is more severe in Africa. Up to 80% of students do not have access to the Internet, and distance learning is out of reach for many. Countries south of the Sahara Desert already have the highest rates of children out of school anywhere in the world. Nearly 20% of children between ages 6 and 11, and more than 30% between ages 12 and 14, or not in school. That information comes from the United Nations Culture and Education Agency. The decision to reopen schools remains a problem, especially as the level of testing remains low. Dr. Rashid Aman is Kenya's Chief Administrative Secretary of Health. He said, One of the things that we have been discussing is how do we monitor the situation in schools where we have large numbers of students. He added, I think definitely we will require to be doing some level of testing in those populations to see whether there is transmission of asymptomatic cases. As in Uganda, Kenya is implementing a phased reopening of schools. Students taking tests to move to upper grade school, high school, and college reported in October. The rest will return in January, but there is widespread concern that schools were reopened too early as some have reported outbreaks. Similar problems are reported in Zimbabwe. More than 100,000 public school teachers have been on strike since schools reopened. The teachers are demanding better pay. They also want protective equipment. 
Raymond Mogjongwe is Secretary General of the Progressive Teachers Union of Zimbabwe. He warned parents against sending their children to school while teachers are on strike. He said, Results of the disaster happening with unmonitored school children will be with us for a long time. Officials in Uganda and Kenya are not testing students for the virus before they come to school. John Nkengasong is head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He told reporters that while his group is not monitoring schools, we naturally expect there will be infections. A mother of five children in Gaza is the Palestinian territory's first woman taxi driver. 39-year-old Naela Abu Jiba says she likes her job, although some people make fun of her for doing it. I get lots of offensive social media comments she recently told Reuters news agency. But the encouraging comments are far greater. Abu Jiba says some of the negative comments target her driving abilities. Some say this is a job for men. Others say we cause accidents, when the fact is women are calmer and more careful drivers than men, she said. Abu Jiba only takes women in her taxi. They must request service ahead of time. Many tell her they feel calmer being driven by her than men. When a woman exits a hairdresser shop, going to a party, dressed and wearing makeup, she feels better riding with a woman, she said. One rider, 28-year-old Susan Abu Atela, told Reuters she does feel more comfortable. Abu Jiba studied and got a degree in community service. But she decided to start her taxi business after failing to find work in her field. She drives a white Kia vehicle and wears a top showing the name of her taxi service, Al Muqtara, which means chieftain in Arabic. Abu Jiba says she hopes to expand her business once the COVID 19 pandemic passes. The health crisis has led to big reductions in travel and social activities in Gaza. The territory of two million people has reported more than 12,000 virus cases and at least 56 deaths. Abu Jiba says she dreams of one day owning a whole al Muqtara fleet. I'm Brian Lynn. Today, we continue our discussion about if and whether. Both words are conjunctions that can sometimes be used in place of each other. The word weather shows that there are two possibilities or choices for something. And sometimes the word if shares this meaning. For instance, you can say, Please find out if my books have arrived, or please find out whether my books have arrived. Other times, only one of the words can be used. 
In part one of this program, we talked about when weather must be used. On today's program, part two, we will talk about when if must be used. I will also explain when the two words are interchangeable. And lastly, I will tell you an easy way to remember which to choose. Let me start by talking about conditionals. Conditional sentences present a condition and a result. In other words, when A happens, B happens. We use if to express a condition. We cannot use weather. Listen to this example. If it rains, we will get wet. In this sentence, if it rains is the condition and we will get wet is the result. Here is another example. I would buy a car if I won the lottery. In this example, the condition is if I won the lottery. The result is I would buy a car. Notice that the condition comes in the second half of the sentence. This change in position does not affect the meaning. Again, the word weather cannot be used to express conditions. Next, let's talk about when if and whether are interchangeable. That means either word can be used with no change in meaning. When reporting yes or no questions, we can use if or whether. Reported questions involve telling someone what another person has asked. Listen to two statements to see what I mean. He asked if I listen to music every night. He asked whether I listen to music every night. We can also use if or whether when asking indirect yes or no questions. An indirect question is one that is worded more politely than a direct question. Listen to the examples. Can you tell me if the train is coming soon? Can you tell me whether the train is coming soon? We can also use if or whether in statements to express doubt about which of two possibilities is true. In these cases, the word or is used. Listen to these statements. We are unsure if the deadline is Wednesday or Friday. We are unsure whether the deadline is Wednesday or Friday. As discussed in Part 1, there are some exceptions. For example, use only weather after prepositions and before infinitive verbs. You can read more about the exceptions in that program. Now, let's talk a little about noun clauses. In all of today's example sentences, except the conditionals, the words if and whether introduce noun clauses. A clause is a part of a sentence with its own subject and verb. Noun clauses act like nouns in sentences. Let's take a closer look at an example. We are unsure whether the deadline is Wednesday or Friday. In this example, the noun clause is whether the deadline is Wednesday or Friday. Notice that the word weather introduces the noun clause. And the subject and verb of that clause are the deadline and is. You can learn more about noun clauses on earlier 
Everyday Grammar Programs. Well, that was a lot of information. So, how can you remember it all? The good news is that you do not have to. If you are ever in doubt about which word to choose, you can keep it simple. The best way to avoid confusion is this. Use if for conditionals and use whether when talking about two possibilities or choices. I'm Alice Bryant. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. On April 9, 1865, Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered his army to Union General Ulysses Grant. Within weeks, the Civil War would be over. When people in Washington learned of Lee's surrender, they hurried to the White House. The crowd wanted to hear from President Abraham Lincoln. The speech he gave would be one of his last, as Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe explained in our series. President Lincoln spoke several days after General Lee's surrender. The people expected a victory speech, but Lincoln gave them something else. Already, he was moving forward from victory to the difficult times ahead. The Southern Rebellion was over. Now, he faced the task of rebuilding the Union. Lincoln did not want to punish the South. He wanted to rejoin the ties that the Civil War had broken. So, when the people of the North expected a speech of victory, he gave them a speech of reconstruction instead. On the night of April 11th, Lincoln appeared before a crowd outside the White House. He held a candle in one hand, and his speech in the other. Fellow citizens, Lincoln said, we meet this evening not in sorrow, but in gladness of heart. The surrender of the main army of the Confederacy gives hope of a righteous and speedy peace. The joy cannot be held back. By these recent successes, we have had pressed more closely upon us the question of Reconstruction. We all agree, Lincoln continued, that the so-called seceded states are out of their correct relation with the Union. We also agree that what the government is trying to do is get these states back into their correct relation. I believe it is not only possible, but in fact easier to do this without deciding the legal question of whether these states have ever been out of the Union. Finding themselves safely at home, it would be of no importance whether they had ever been away. There was cheering and applause when President Lincoln finished, but less than when he began. The speech had been too long and too detailed to please the crowd. Lincoln, however, believed it a success. He hoped he had made the country understand one thing— the great need to forget hatred and bitterness in the difficult time of rebuilding that would follow the war. The President continued to discuss his ideas on Reconstruction over the next few days. On Friday, April 14th, 
he agreed to put this work aside for a while. In the afternoon, he took his wife, Mary, for a long drive away from the city. In the evening, they would go to the theater. One of the popular plays of the time, called Our American Cousin, was being performed at Ford's Theater, not far from the White House. The Secretary of War did not want the Lincolns to go alone. He ordered an army officer to go with them. The President and Mrs. Lincoln sat in special seats at Ford's Theater. The presidential box was above and to one side of the stage. A guard always stood outside the door to the box. On this night, however, the guard did not remain. He left the box unprotected. President Lincoln settled down in his seat to enjoy the play. As he did so, a man came to the door of the box. He carried a gun in one hand and a knife in the other. The man entered the presidential box quietly. He slowly raised the gun. He aimed it at the back of Lincoln's head. He fired. Then the man jumped from the box to the stage, three meters below. Many in the theater recognized him. He was an actor, John Wilkes Booth. Booth broke his leg when he hit the stage floor, but he pulled himself up, shouted, Sic semper tyrannis, thus ever to tyrants and ran out the door. He got on a horse and was gone. The attack was so quick that the audience did not know what had happened. Then a woman shouted, The president has been shot. Lincoln had fallen forward in his seat, unconscious. Someone asked if it was possible to move him to the White House. A young army doctor said no. The president's wound was terrible. He would die long before reaching the White House. So Lincoln was moved to a house across the street from Ford's Theater. A doctor tried to remove the bullet from the president's head. He could not. Nothing could be done except wait. The end was only hours away. Cabinet members began to arrive, while wild reports spread through the city. The Confederates had declared war again. There was fighting in the streets. An official of the War Department described the situation. The extent of the plot was unknown. From so horrible a beginning, what might come next? How far would the bloody work go? The safety of Washington must be looked after. The people must be told. The assassin and his helpers must be captured. Early the next morning, April 15th, Abraham Lincoln died. A prayer was said over his body. His eyes were closed. The news went out by telegraph to cities and towns across the country. People read the words but could not believe them. To millions of Americans, Abraham Lincoln's death was a personal loss. They had come to think of him as more than the President of the United States. He was a trusted friend. 
People hung black cloth on their doors in sorrow. Even the South mourned for Lincoln, its former enemy. Southern General Joe Johnston said, Mr. Lincoln was the best friend we had. His death is the worst thing that could happen for the South. Messages of regret came from around the world. British labor groups said they could never forget the things Lincoln had said about working people, things such as the strongest tie of human sympathy should be one uniting all working people of all nations and tongues. A group representing hundreds of French students sent this message. In President Lincoln, we mourn a fellow citizen. There are no longer any countries shut up in narrow frontiers. Our country is everywhere where there are neither masters nor slaves, wherever people live in liberty or fight for it. We look to the other side of the ocean to learn how a people which is known how to make itself free knows how to preserve its freedom. The assassination of Abraham Lincoln touched the imagination of America's writers. Many tried to put their feelings into words. Walt Whitman wrote several poems of mourning. Here is part of one of them. O oh, Captain, my Captain. Here, Captain, dear father, this arm beneath your head. It is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound. Its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip the victor ship comes in with object one. Exult, O shores and ring, O oh, bells, but I, with mournful tread, walk the deck my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in the spring. That is the time of year when lilac plants burst into flower throughout much of the United States. One of Walt Whitman's most beautiful poems in honor of Lincoln is called When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. Here is part of that poem. When lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night, I mourned, and yet shall mourn with ever-returning spring. Ever-returning spring, Trinity sure to me you bring, Lilac, blooming perennial and drooping star in the west, and thought of him I love. Coffin that passes through lanes and streets, through day and night with the great cloud darkening the land, with the countless torches lit, with the silent sea of faces and the unbared heads, with the tolling, tolling bell's perpetual clang. Here, coffin that slowly passes, I give you my sprig of lilac. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 